Hello, everyone. This is Megan. And this is Alana. And welcome to Tea Time Crimes. Halloween edition. Finale of the Spooky Month. Yeah, you seemed hesitant in your intro when you said this is Alana. Are you not feeling it? No, absolutely not feeling it. <laughs> okay, just it's just one time. It's just it's just the one time. I know, I'm but doing... it's one time. Everything will get seared in my brain, and then it's not one time for me. It's every night. I mean, have your earmuffs handy. I'm going to do my best to earmuff you through this episode, okay? But we are doing God. our final spooky edition, and this one is, we're deviating a little bit. There's no crime in this one. This is straight spook. It's really just tea time true. Tea time true. There's no crime that's happening. It's I just find it fascinating, and it's Ugh. for Halloween. And Alana's a champ. I hate it already. But tell me about you. What's going on? We have a few extra critters in the house. Robot vacuums? <laughs> no. <laughs> No more Rupert's. Rupert does the job well. We have a baby squirrel and a teenage cat. Sounds about right. So while I was away in Vermont, Chris was driving across the GNO, which is the big bridge that you hated driving over multiple times. She means uh, me. When yeah, you were here. I don't like bridges. It's a big bridge, right? It's a, like 180 feet off the ground, whatever. It's a, over the Mississippi River. Let's set the scene. So Chris is driving across and he sees something on like the, not quite at the bridge, right before the bridge on the, it's not a banister. What do you call this thing on the side? Railing? Sure. Well, the concrete one though. Um, He sees something. He's like, is that an animal? So he goes, he goes all the way back around over the other bridge and then back to it. This is a freeway too, by the way. And he's like, holy shit, it's a cat. Just grabbing on, holding on for dear life, he, he'll either fall into the Mississippi to his death or he'll fall into oncoming traffic, 50 to 70 mile per hour cars. So Chris pulls over on this half of a shoulder on the freeway bridge thing, gets out, and Chris is terrified of heights. And he's like slowly creeping over the edge. He's shaking. He scruffs the cat, grabs it to his chest. Luckily, the cat didn't. Uh, protest at all. Yeah, I was going to say, the cat could have freaked. The cat was like, nope, please save me. <laughs> uh, he knew. Um, and so, and then Chris had just had to like lean on the car for a while because the cars were going way too fast. He couldn't even get back in the car. But then eventually he got back in and he was already on the way to the vet to get some meds. Isn't that crazy? So he, he brought it to the vet to get checked out and stuff. And it would have been like a little beat up, like scuffed on the face his paws and claws and stuff. But we're keeping him. He's vaccinated and neutered. Uh, he's a sweetie boy. And so, yeah, that, I, that's the hero status for Chris. That was pretty cool. So you're just fostering it and trying to find it at home? He's not mm -hmm. going into the family fold? No. We don't want to upset the balance. I mean, he <laughs> is so sweet and lovely and, like, very cuddly and just – he's a great cat. But – we already have a lot. Uh, email us at Tea Time Crimes if yeah. you're interested in adopting a cat. <laughs> yeah. We have really high standards. Yeah. Uh, we were, we're hoping, like, our vet seemed a little interested. Uh, we would love to have one of our brothers take it. Just like someone, we like, this cat could have died, so we want to move it to a really awesome life for the rest of its life. Yeah, I mean, you'll have to, like, hand make its food and give it massages every day for Alana to no. accept you, but... It, it'll Kibble's be high standards. fine. <laughs> Kibble's fine. Yeah, he seems really <laughs> sweet. But, he I mean, is. that's a fascinating story. But really, what I'm interested about is the squirrel. Because this is the second time you've had a squirrel in your house. <laughs> and I correct. don't 
as for someone who loves animals, I can never understand how this is happening. They're cute. And you are right now, you are bottle feeding this squirrel every four hours, Correct. including during the night. I can post the video. Yes. Every four hours. So I have to wait. I'm going to adjust it a little bit so I don't have to wake up twice during the night. So where do you find these things? So the first time in LA, it fell out of a palm tree when we were walking Noke. <laughs> it literally fell out right in front of us and we're like, cool, it's a baby squirrel that's dead, but it was alive, so we nursed it back to health. Baby squirrels are pitiful. They have no senses, so when they are really weak senses, so they'll just crawl up to anything if they're lost and, you know, cat, bye, you're dead. So how'd you find this one? Did it fall out of a tree onto you? So, no, he was at a, a rescue, like rummage sale or whatever those things are, and... A rescue rummage sale? Yeah, you know, like how certain rescues will have, like, They'll do, they'll get donated items and then they'll sell them. Like the Humane Society used to have a store back in Boulder. Oh, okay. Anyways, it was like a secondhand shop. It's kind of cool. Okay. And this rescue needed help. They had just gotten a baby squirrel in and they needed help to foster it until it was old enough to uh, release. Oh, okay. So this, this one didn't fall into your lap. No, no, no. It didn't literally fall from palm tree into our okay. lap. Okay. <laughs> Chris was like, I have squirrel experience. Yeah. And I'll apply it here. And he, we, we did have Piglet for a while. That was the previous squirrel. That was what we named her. <laughs> So how long are you going to have this squirrel? I think like two weeks. Oh, okay. Uh-uh. And then is that how long a squirrel needs to be bottle fed? And then does it go back to the rescue yes. or does it go to the wild? What happens? I, I'm not sure if it, it goes live in your backyard? when it can go back into the wild. Okay. <gasps> I said back wild. Uh, that would be cool. We do have squirrels that visit all the time. We have our chickens. We have these whistling ducks who come in and then squirrels. <laughs> You are something else. All right. Only well, the chickens are ours. Does this this squirrel have a name? Peanut. Good luck to you, Peanut. <laughs> You're one lucky squirrel, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so yeah, that's uh that's the story over here. Um Yowzas. All right, well yeah. that that was a long story. Let's hop into that tea. Mm. Who and what tea do you have today? You told me this was gonna be a scary episode. Yeah. So I needed some protective tea. So I oh. got, I'm getting a happy witch blend. So Ooh. I'm just going to, whenever I get scared, I'm going to say, I'm a happy witch. I'm a happy witch. And just <laughs> pretend everything's fine. <laughs> so it's the same company, Sunshine, Sunshine, Sunshine Cottage. Sunshine yeah. oh. Cottage. Hold on. We have to stop and talk about this because I didn't realize this until <laughs> after last she week. She had a huge realization. While I was editing and I kept hearing the name Sunshine Cottage. I'm like, God, that's so familiar. So if you'll remember, your tea from last week was from Sunshine Cottage and you said it was from yep. Saxons River. And I was like, oh, yeah, I know Saxons River. Well, I had a memory when I was in high school for a couple of months. I worked at a place called Sunshine Cottage 2 in a neighboring town. And I was like, oh my God, is the woman's name Joan? And it is. And it is my old boss from when I was a senior in high school. So crazy. That was like, oh, I need Halloween teas. I got this on Etsy because I was like, I want more uh, themed teas for the next few months. And there she was. I'm blown away. I cannot believe, I literally worked at that store. The coincidence. Man. I can't even wrap my brain around that. That's wild. So it's safe. It's certainly safe. You don't have to worry about it's it. Joan's solid. She's vetted. She's not an Italian widow, like sending her son off to war. No, she's, I mean, she may be Italian, but she is uh, safe. <laughs> and I, I remember Ooh. working for her and I like, I was cracking myself up thinking about it because, you know, you're like 16 or 17 or whatever, and you're just not the same work ethic that you might have now. Uh, sure. And I was at this little shop all by myself. Nobody was there because she had the other shop in Saxons River, which I didn't. Oh, that's why okay. I didn't draw the connection. And I would be alone all day. And it was this really like crafty Vermont cute gift shop. Oh, and I, I was I had to do things like gift wrap. And I, I mean, I know how to gift wrap now, but wrapping a present is something you either know how to do or you don't. I'm still not good at it. Yeah, I think like the amount of tape. I used and I didn't know how to do ribbons. <laughs> so I was just like taping strings of ribbon to the center and like curling them and being like, I think that looks great. And I would oh play, God. you had to play music and she had her own CDs there. Like it was like Nutcracker Suite and things like that. And I would yeah. bring Janice Joplin and like play <gasps> the deep tracks 
But like the softer stuff, but I'm thinking now, like maybe that wasn't the brand she was going for. Hey, maybe. And th- and then she one time she had this big cart in the center of the shop where she would put big displays. Mm-hmm. It was like an old wooden, almost like a donkey cart. Like a donkey would pull? Yeah, like a donkey would pull. Okay. And it had shelves on either side of it. And she said, oh, try your – go ahead and put a display up. And I came in the next day and my display was gone. <laughs> and that, <laughs> that was the, the correct choice because when I saw her display, I was like, oh, <laughs> that's what it should look like. Um, oh because God. I had like Adrian monked it and everything was lined up perfectly. Oh. And there were like three things on top and like three things on the bottom and five things in Wasn't the middle. Wasn't that like cozy, kitschy no. atmosphere type? Yeah. And I, when she came in, it was like very beautifully done. And there was like a ton of things on there that would be in the center yeah. of the store that people might, their eye would be drawn to. And I was like, oh, no, that, that looks Yours better. Yours would fit into um, the Shit's Creek store. Yeah, it was very minimalist. Yeah, I really had something going there. <laughs> right? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, hi to Joan at Sunshine Cottage. I can't believe. Hi, Joan. You'd make really good teas, man. Yeah, here we are. This is unbelievable. Here so, go ahead. Are. Get out your happy yeah. witch tea. Let's do this. Can I read the description? Please do. I don't know why you wouldn't. Make your inner witch happy with sweet apples, cinnamon, and spice, and a touch of vanilla for smoothness. Magical. That sounds delicious. Let me look for any other ingredients. Why is it so dark in here? Oh, my God. Because it's spooky time. Stop. (laughs) I'm going to invite the sun in. Stop. I'm going to love this. But it has all the good, like clove, cardamom, ginger. It's going to be great. I'm almost positive it should go with milk. <sighs> smells like apple cider. It always smells I like I saw apple little cider. apple chunks in it. So it's – and her her tea is all loose leaf tea, which I'm using the same cup as Oh, okay. Week. Not in your cup. In the tea bag. I feel better now. Okay. First sip, no milk or sans milk, as they say in France. Lord help us. Mm. It almost tastes like Thanksgiving. Ooh. Like there's that there's that touch of a uh, holiday spirit winking in. It's like, hey, it's like it's flirting with it a little bit. Oh, hey there, holiday spirit. I, I feel the black tea. It's not as deep as the black cat tea was last week. Obviously. Um, but it, it kind of it just like I imagine it as like a, a peaceful lake and it's like just it's not rushing. It's just like flowing and sitting in my mouth. I'm gonna put some milk in. I know our listeners love this sound. Oh, I said listeners. Hey, there you go. You're getting it. It was a big swallow. It's really, I want to say round. Okay, say it. That's that's how it feels. Like it feels like very round when I drink it. It's all encompassing. So this is this is a great tea. Cool. I would say a cozy thumbs up. Ooh. It's very similar to a gloved thumbs up oh, because you really should be chilly when you're drinking this. And it'll really bring in the fall spirit, but you could be cozy too in front of a fire. That's that is permitted. Permitted. All right. Per- Sun, that is permitted. Shine, cottage. Full circle. You nice came to see through you again. this holiday season of Halloween. Sorry about my display skills. Yeah. Okay. Are you ready? All right. I hope you have a great episode. Um, let me know when you're done. I'll come back for the sign-off. <laughs> I was wondering if that's the best thing. I was, I was, so I was so interested in this. I ordered a book from Amazon and it didn't come till last night. And I had to speed read it last night. And I was a little scared when I was done. Anyway, here we go. FML. So today is the haunting of the Wyrick family. Oh, buckle up. Why, it's, Rick? The year is 1989. It is a time period I don't need to research. Wait. Because I was there. Yeah, that's too recent. Yeah, I, I'm in New England. I've got jelly shoes. I've got a glitter scrunchie. Oh, I'm listening yes. to Paul Abdul, waiting yes. for my brother to be born, setting the seed. But in Ellerslie, Georgia, the Wyrick family has just bought their new home. No. They'd been searching for over a year to find a home that fit into their budget and that checked all the boxes. Yeah, well, this housing market. And they are thrilled to find a home 
that is big enough, that has a yard, that is in a good neighborhood so that they can settle in as a family and start to raise, well, they've been raising her, but they can settle in as a family with their three-year-old daughter, Heidi. Now, the parents, Andy and Lisa, are very young. They started out early. Lisa was 17 when she gave birth to Heidi, and it was a terrifying delivery. Lisa was rushed into emergency surgery because the cord was wrapped twice around Heidi's neck and the amniotic sac was covering her face. (gasps) Oh, my gosh. And when the doctor pulled her out, he admitted later he didn't think that she would survive. Yeah. But she did. The cord is wrapped around her. The doctors save her. Now, there's an old wives' tale that what what we now now know as the amniotic sac to be stuck on the face, it's called being born with a veil. And it said, the wi- old wives' tale said that when you're born like this, you have powers or you're destined for greatness. Probably because if that happens and you survive, it's probably incredible at that, especially, mm. you know, later on in time saying, yeah. before science, right? It's like, oh my God, before they science. survive. <laughs> yeah, right. So Lisa gives birth the baby's okay. Heidi's okay. Lisa's okay. She's in kind of this post labor, you know, fog, which Buzz, you are. Yeah. And nurses are, and doctors are just coming in and out, and it's kind of all of a blur. But then she distinctly remembers this woman standing over her, and she remembers her because her eyes were incredibly green. And this woman stands over her and says, Your daughter was born with a veil. I'm paraphrasing, but your daughter was born with a veil. So she's going to have powers that people aren't going to understand. You need to take care of her. And Lisa goes to ask questions, but she basically falls asleep or falls out of consciousness. Yeah, like, who the fuck are you? Yeah. And then when she wakes up, she asks her husband about it. And Andy's like, I don't know. I haven't seen anyone like that. And then she asks all the nurses about it. There's nobody who fits that description. Fever dream. On our staff. And so Andy's like, "It, it was a dream, Lisa. It was a dream. And she's like, no, it wasn't a dream. I was awake. It was clearly a dream. We were out of it. Let's put it to rest. You're fine. So I'm with him. That was the day that Heidi was born. Now they're moving into this house. This house had been abandoned by the previous family. Why? And nobody knows why. Well, well, well okay. When you say abandoned, does they just move to another place? It's just a, a dramatic way of saying they moved no, somewhere else. No, I don't mean that. I mean the house had been left for years and was just basically trying to be auctioned off at this point because no one had bought it and it was overgrown. Oh. And they needed to do a lot of work on it. So they find this house in the neighborhood. No other houses in this neighborhood have been abandoned. It's kind of the odd man out here. So Lisa's father and Andy are able to do most of the repairs themselves. So this would be a good deal for them because, you know, I can't do it. I can't barely hammer a nail, but (laughs) they can do that kind of stuff. So they are thinking that they'll be able to fix it up because it's structurally a good home and it's in a good neighborhood. Yeah. And they just have to put some work and effort into it. They're only in their they're like 20, 21, 22 years old. Right, because so, they had her when she was young. Yeah, they're so young. So their budget is really constrained. And so they make a bid and they bid the lowest possible amount that is accepted. And the real estate agent's like, I mean, it's not going to happen. I've never seen a house go for that cheap in this area. It's just not going to happen, but you know, I'll let yeah, you know. But it does because nobody else wants it. Yes. So this family is very faith-based. They're very devoted. And so they spend the time waiting for an answer by praying for it and praying for to be able to have a house like this and to be able to start their family here. It takes a whole month, but eventually the real estate agent gets back and says, you got it. It's yours. Don't do it. So the family moves in and they're moving in. It's moving day. It's just, you know, how moving's one of the worst things. It's one of the worst things no matter what. <laughs> it all, never goes. It's Every always a pain. aspect of it is terrible and you almost get divorced. <laughs> it's just awful, yes. So Lisa and Andy are moving it, everything in. I'm sure they have family helping, but you know Heidi's only three, so she's not old enough to help. So she's oh just kind God. of sitting I, in the I yard. Throw a toddler in the mix. Yeah, Jeez. and the whole time that they're packing and unpacking, Heidi's just standing outside staring at the chimney. And Andy's like, "What is she looking at?" And he keeps looking up, there's thinking, mice in it. thinking there's something up there, and there's some birds flying around. She must yeah, just be watching the is. birds. Yep. And they try to engage her, and she's like, I'm too little to do anything. Heidi's very I'm smart, so little. she's very well-spoken for a three-year-old. I mean, she might have a speech, you know, also like a three-year-old voice, a little speech impediments, yeah. but she can carry on a conversation better than the average three-year-old. So oh, keep I that in mind. I have a bad feeling about this. As we move on. So they move into the house. They get settled. You know, they're doing the work to fix it up. And in February, Heidi's outside playing. And this is what they 
we're hoping for, right? Lisa's inside, able to do that, whatever she's doing, housework, chores, you know, taking care of business inside. And Lisa's out in the backyard playing uh, with her dog. Heidi. And her dog goes under the porch. Yeah. No, no, Lisa went outside and played jump rope. It was her time. (laughs) Hey, that's great. Thank you. Heidi. So Heidi's outside playing. Lisa's inside. Yes, correct. And Heidi's trying to get her dog out from under the porch because he's stuck under there kind of hiding, scared of something. No, there's a there's a corpse. No, there's no dead bodies. There are no dead bodies in the story, actually. So just relax okay. into it. Just lean in. And oh. Heidi's calling for her dog to come out. And then so she's down like on the ground, right? Bones. Dirt, dirt in her face. No. She looks to the side and there's a pair of shoes next to her. And she looks Get up out. and there's run. There, there's a man standing there. And he says very politely, Hi. I'm under Mr. the porch? He's no, he's standing next to her. The dog's under the oh porch. She's God. on all fours when she so she's just seeing what's in front of her okay. at eye level, which happens to be she's at shoe level because she's on the ground. She sees this man and he says, Hi, I'm Mr. Gordy. And you know, she says, I'm Heidi. And he asks her how old she is. And he says, I have a swing in my backyard. Would you like to swing with me? And I'll push you. I'm paraphrasing all this. And stranger danger. She says, I'll have to. I have to ask my mama. And he says, yeah, of Good, course. Good, Heidi. Of course. And he says, well, I'll, I'll, you know, ask your mama, you know, I'll see you another time, you know, bye. So Heidi goes inside. That was weird. And she says, mommy, can I swing with the man? And I, and Lisa's like, uh, what man? You know, right? This is 1989 in the early 90s. I feel like Stranger Danger was really taking form. I remember getting like yeah. school talks about it. Me too, me too. I mean, we had lectures about it. The Dare program was yeah. Was do you remember that theme song? Mm-mm. I just remember the shirts. Dare to keep your kids off drugs. Anyway, uh, yeah. I mean, I think white vans were just yeah. a big thing that in this took, time. Yep, yep. Child abductions went up, so it's a real thing. So Lisa's terrified. She like is looking around. She sees no man. She's like, "What did the man look like?" And Heidi describes him. She said he had on a gray suit and he had gray hair. And he was an older man. I know what this is. And so she doesn't know what to do. Lisa's very nervous. So she kind of sits Heidi down, gets is trying to get her a snack and give her a toy. And she's trying to decide what to do. She goes to the gun cabinet and it's locked and she can't find the key. And so then she just grabs a butcher knife just in case there's a man out there oh, stalking them. Yeah, Lisa's ready to protect Where's Andy? Andy's at work, and he's a truck okay. foreman for the county, so he travels a lot. A lot. But Lisa eventually, after stewing for a minute, thinks, I'm just going to try him and see. Maybe he's at the office. And she calls. He is at the office. He flies. People didn't have cell phones, folks. That's right. He flies home as fast as he can. He comes barging in, and, and Heidi's just chill. She's sitting on the couch. She's got her little toy train, and she says, Daddy, can you put new batteries in it for me? And he's like, hold on. You know, I got to go hunt a guy who is trying to abduct you. He goes to the gun cabinet, unlocks it, grabs a gun, and leaves. He starts canvassing the neighborhood with a gun. It's Georgia, he's, baby. He's serious. This whole time, Lisa's at home, doors locked. You know, she's kind of keep very vigilant. Andy comes back. He talks to all the neighbors. Nobody even knows. I don't know a man that looks like that. I don't know a man that by that name. I don't I don't know what you're talking about. Andy comes back and he tells Lisa, I, I couldn't find anybody. You know, I guess let's just, are you sure that she saw somebody? And Lisa said, well, Heidi doesn't make stuff up. You know, it's not, it's just not who she is as a kid. And they decide that they'll just... Keep an eye out and be extra vigilant over the next few days. And then that toy train that had run out of batteries just scoots across the floor. And Lisa's like, oh, did you put new batteries in? He's like, no. When would I have had time to do that? It's just, it, it didn't need new batteries. It was already good. And Heidi was wrong. That's well, a simple explanation. Lisa went to check it and it still didn't work. So she's throwing that out well, there. Well, it could have been, you know, how some houses are not level. It can roll. Yeah, ma- yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe that's what happened. Yeah. Or they should just move out now. I mean, I'd support that too. Yeah, yeah. So Heidi continues to talk about Mr. Gordy all the time. He plays, he comes over to play with her all the time, pushes her on the swing. They have tea parties. Lisa just starts accepting that Mr. How can ghosts push real objects? Lisa just starts accepting that Mr. Gordy is her imaginary friend. 
Lots of kids have them. Actually, I, I looked it up and 65% of kids have imaginary friends. So she just starts expe- expecting Mr. Gordy to kind of be in their everyday life. Okay, she has a friend. It's Mr. Gordy. She's an only child. There aren't any kids to play with. She's not in school yet. You know, what harm can it do? This is totally normal. She even consults the pediatrician at one point. And the pediatrician reassures her, yeah, that's normal. Don't worry about it. So one day there's a knock at the door. Lisa's in the middle of something. Heidi goes to answer it. She's three. I think she's, yeah, she may be four at this time. Trust me, you can't control kids. Honest to God, if you try to go to the bathroom for five seconds and something happens and you come out and you're like, how did you, like, why are you doing that, kid? He'll open the door to a stranger? uh, Yeah, he'll do, yeah, he just goes nuts. They'll do anything. Wow. They don't know. I mean, you tell them not to, but I mean, it takes a minute. He, I think he's probably better now, but he's five. Mm-hmm. I mean, once they learn to open the door, they're so proud that they know how to open the door. They're like, <laughs> I'm going to utilize any opportunity I can to do this. <laughs> so she goes to the door, she opens it, and there's a man standing there. Now, Heidi is not scared at all. She's not scared. However, this man's appearance is a little concerning. Earmuff, Alana. He has blood all over his white t-shirt and he's holding his hand against his body and it's all bandaged. I'm back. So Heidi asks him, what's wrong? And he said, oh, this, I, I get hurt a long time ago. I know you have to ask your mom, but would you like to play? And Heidi's like, I'll go ask my mom. So she goes to ask her mom. Stranger danger has not been enforced with Heidi. I know it has. scared. It has, but Heidi is very perceptive, and she feels that Mr. Gordy and this man are kind, and she's really good at sensing that. So Heidi goes back to to Lisa and lets her know, and again, Lisa's concerned and starts looking because of the description that you just earmuffed for. Lisa starts looking around to see if, in fact, there is a man fitting that description. There is not. But Heidi says that this man's name is Khan. So Heidi starts talking about Khan and Mr. Gordy kind of interchangeably and all the time. And Andy and Lisa assume that it is just one man named Khan Gordy. Did he spell it? No, I can't spell it. I don't know how it's spelled. It's like Star Trek. A few months go by. We're talking about, you know, Mr. Gordy or Khan just around the clock. They're her buddies. But then there starts to be something a little bit scarier in the house. That Heidi sees that doesn't fit into no, this already scared. imaginary friend zone. One one day, Lisa's drying her hair. She realizes that it's super cold, and she's like, God, why is the house so cold? Heidi's sitting on the bed, and Heidi looks at her mom. I'm paraphrasing, but looks at her mom and says, uh, Mommy, there's a man behind you. No. And Lisa turns around, and there's nothing there. And she's like, what are you talking about? She said, there is a man. And she said, you mean Mr. Gordy, right? And she said, no, not Mr. Gordy. And this is the, this is what they start to call the dark figure because Heidi is never able to see this man's face. It is just the silhouette of a man. Well, that's who's going to be visiting me tonight. And Heidi, (laughs) no, no, he's not. He's gone. Heidi does not like having him around. She does not feel safe with him around. It's not the same way that she feels. Gotta trust your gut, girl. About Mr. Gordy or Khan. She does not like the dark figure. So Lisa's freaked out enough that she just kind of runs out of the house and they get in the car and they go somewhere else for a yeah, few. Yeah, go to the mall. Well, she can try to understand what's happening. Even though that's a scary place yeah. too. Yeah, and around the same time, the house next door to them goes up for sale, and Lisa's sister, Joyce, actually purchases it. Now, Lisa's... No, everybody's going to die. No, nobody dies. Lisa's from a big family, but she was born a lot later than all of her other brothers and sisters, so they're all a lot older than her. Okay. But she's close with Joyce, but Joyce's kids are teenage college age because she's so much older than her younger sister. Now, Joyce moves in next door, which is great. The family's excited. They love having Joyce there. They're... You know, it's somebody else for Heidi to be with. You know, the kids, the niece and nephew can babysit. Yeah. They love having their family close by. It's a good situation. Yeah. And so Joyce buys the house and then one day the former owner comes by with some paperwork for Joyce. Okay, I thought you just might want to have this. The house had been in her family for a long time. I thought you might want to have it. So she hands it to her and Joyce is looking through it. And at the bottom of one of the papers, she sees the name James Gordy. 
Stop it right now. And she's and she knows about Mr. Gordy because she knows Heidi talks about this imaginary friend constantly. And she's like, oh my God. So she <sighs> runs next door to Lisa. She's like, Lisa, look, it's not Mr. Smith, right? It's right. Kind of an unusual enough name that what are the odds? I don't know a Mr. Gordy. Right. Well, not yet. Stop. She had asked the owner, like, who is this guy? Who is Mr. Gordy? She said, oh, he was a friend of the family. He was a caretaker of this place, and he was the executor of my mother's estate, and he would sign papers for her and take care of things for her. He was a very, very nice man, and he's been dead since 1974. And they're like, okay, all right. So Lisa goes to the library because this is a time when you have to go to the library to learn anything, and she has to pull up all the old newspapers on the micro would it just thing? be dial up right now? But there's nothing really on the internet. So it's like there's not much there. <laughs> yeah. Like I don't know if people can understand that today. Like there just wasn't a lot of stuff on the on the web at this right? point. You log in and you check your email and it's thrilling. Which is a foreign concept. Must must be foreign to Gen Z to even try to conceptualize it. Well, it's also still 1989. Like I, I didn't have internet in the house in 1989. When did we get internet? I have no I, idea. I don't, I don't remember having it for a while after that. Mm-hmm. Even if it existed, it wasn't, you know, it takes a while to, to get places. It wasn't widely spread, yeah, like chamber pots and indoor plumbing. Exactly like that. Exactly. They find out that he was the caretaker. Lisa goes to the library. She's looking up everything, and he does exist. She sees his name in print. She finds where he's buried, and she thinks, okay, I'm going to take Heidi to the cemetery and just show her Mr. Gordy's try to exp- try to reason with her. Maybe if she understands this, maybe this will somehow help her or help h- whatever's going on, maybe it'll help. So they have to go. The cemetery is not in their county, so they have to drive a little bit. They get there. Can't wait to get out of the car. She gets out of the car and Lisa's like, whoa, 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 hold up, hold up. And Heidi just makes a beeline right down the rows. Stops right in front of Mr. Gordy's grave. I'm out. And she can't read. She can't read. So she says, what does it say? And they have to read it to her. And it's Mr. Gordy's grave. Do you have a question? I have a comment. Go. Remember remember when we were playing a word game at your house and uh, your son was looking at my cards and I'm like, no, he's got to tell me what it says or like help help Brad cheat. Yeah. You yelled at my baby and And I was like, like, "Mm, he can't even read. read. I think I yelled at Brad, to be fair. Just like my son, Heidi can't read yet. So she goes, <laughs> makes a beeline, they read it to her. Whoa, what is happening? Andy and Lisa, God bless them. They are so confused. Like, what do you do here? What do you, they don't even know what to make of it. This is too much to be a coincidence. Move. Right? They brought her to the doctor. It's too much to be a coincidence. She doesn't really seem scared. She seems to like Mr. Gordy. So, I guess we'll just go on with our lives. But the dark figure gets meaner. What? And there are some incidents with him. Can we give him a different name? Just for Sure. Me? What, would you, what would you like to call him? Harry. All right. So Harry has some anger issues. Okay. And he lets it be known. But as that's happening, also other members in the family are starting to see, not see what Heidi sees, but they're starting to experience some unusual things. For instance, a chair moved across the room, turned around, and got pushed right in front of them. Uh, the water faucets turn on. The cabinet doors are open. Do we believe them? I do. I don't. I do. <laughs> I really do. Well. But keep going. Yeah, well, yeah, go ahead. And then Harry starts to get really pretty aggressive. You're gonna want to ear him off. I've I've I have a new technique. I'm just gonna mute here. Now go. So one morning, Heidi's on the couch watching Saturday morning cartoons. Lisa and Andy are doing their thing, and Heidi feels this presence again. She always feels really cold when the dark figure is around. So Katie said name because Alana's not listening. And she feels cold and then she feels scared and she wants to run, but she feels like she can't move. And then a pillow is put over her face and she feels like she can't breathe and she can't scream. Eventually the pillow releases and she screams bloody murder and her parents come running. 
So that's one instance, which is really shocking because it seems like most of the time when people experience these spirits, they're not able to have any physical interaction with them. A s- even scarier episode happened where Heidi was asleep in her bed and she woke up crying and her face was burning. And she- I'm still earmuffed. Yeah. Okay. She ran into her parents' bedroom and she had three distinct scratches on her face. And she was crying because it was burning. That was a long earmuff. I had I had to change it. Okay, okay. So something happened. Yeah, they were so scared they got in the car and they left for the night. Wow. Now they don't know what to make of this. How is this even possible? And they come home the next night and they, they're they're seriously considering moving at this point. But they don't have the money to move. Okay, whatever happened, that's great. They can't afford to move. I'm not even going to tell you because it's just not worth your okay. sanity. They can't <laughs> afford to move and they want to. Thank you. And they th- they're trying to think of, you know, reasonable ex- explanations for what might cause this. The next night, the same thing happens again, but it happens to Andy. But what? why don't they go to her sister's house? I don't think it's far enough away, to be honest with you. Okay. Right next door. Am I Ear muff. Yeah. May. So Andy has scratches, three distinct scratches on his side, and it's also burning. It seemed, the way they described it, more than just a normal scratch on the skin would, like it's really burning hot. And some sources say that this happened to Andy repeatedly for the next several days. Seemed scary just by your facial expressions. No, it scared the crap out of me. <laughs> so with this happening, this is a new. This is a new level. They're super. So scared. I'm assuming they're get the Harry's getting really involved and like messing stuff up. Yeah. Yeah. Now Lisa had had two miscarriages mm. after Heidi. They were able to have a daughter named Jordan. Oh. In 1994. So Heidi is what, like nine at this point? She's like, yeah, she's like nine or ten. Yeah. So they welcome Jordan into the house. They're super excited. And then probably the scariest thing of all I read in the book last night happens to Jordan. You're going to want to earmuff. Oh, just a baby. Okay, bye. She's okay. She's, She's fine. But earmuff. Yeah. So like I said, Joyce's kids were older. So Joyce's daughter was babysitting Jordan and Jordan's a baby. So she, you know, feeds her and puts her in her crib, puts her down for a nap. And then the babysitter's name is Nikki. Nikki grabs something because she's suddenly very cold and she sits down on the couch. She's really cold. She kind of cuddles up in it and she falls asleep. She apparently has this incredible nightmare where she's looking and searching for a crying baby in a morgue. And when she finds the baby, it's too late looks up to the sky in her dream and somebody's trying to tell her something but she can't understand it and she wakes up freaked out and she immediately runs into the baby's room and somehow Jordan has a ribbon tied around her neck and she's turning blue. Nikki screams as loud as she can so loud that her mother hears it next door and she runs next door with the baby. Joyce quickly grabs some scissors and cuts it free. Jordan is fine. But like, what the heck? Oh, for Lana, we're here. That would have been an F word. How is that even possible? Joyce said the string looked like it had been tied into hundreds of small knots. How did that even happen? How is that possible? All right. Based on your hand movements and facial expressions, I assume so. Harry came to Jordan at night and there was blood all over something. And no, it no, no. Made Jordan's fine. suffocated. No, and, Jordan's and fine. And then they're like, we have to get out. No, nope, Jordan's fine, but she had a scary moment. But Jordan's fine thanks to her cousin's fast actions. Now, what they at, do? This po- at this point, Lisa's like, what is going on? This I can't take this anymore. I can't live like this. What are we going to do? So she, she calls Dr. William Roll, who studies paranormal science, and he went to Oxford. This is a smart dude. This is what he does. And she explains what's happening to him, and he's really interested because he's never heard a case like this, and he comes and interviews the family. Now, he says his first process is to interview the family and see if maybe there is 
anything going on? Is the child making it up? Is the child doing it for attention? Is there any mental illness in the family? And he sits down and he talks with the family, with everybody in the family. And he very quickly decides that this family is sane, that this family is loving, that this family truly believes what is happening to them and something is going on. So he he does a ton of tests. He's really trying to get to the bottom of this scientifically. He thinks that what is happening is what he calls place memories, which is a phenomenon that the energy of a person gets trapped. And it's almost like a recording of a person instead of ghosts. This is what he believes instead of ghosts. And so he believes that Heidi is so sensitive that that's what she's seeing. I'm just throwing it out there. Now, Heidi's never seen a picture of Mr. Gordy. She's only described him. So Dr. Roll contacts the family and gets a picture of Mr. Gordy. And then he finds a picture of, you know, 10 other guys who look like Mr. Gordy and he hands them all. And line them up. Yeah, he hands them all to Heidi, and she's going and through. And she picks Mr. Gordy. She's like, here's Mr. Gordy. Here's my buddy. God. Yep, that is Mr. Gordy. And she's like, yeah, he's my friend. I know. He's my friend. Yeah, well, he better protect against Harry. Exactly what he's doing. And then also, separate from Dr. Roll, just take a left turn for a second, the same owner of the house who had given the papers with, with Gordy's name on it, she also came by with some family photos just to see if there was anything in there. And Heidi was like, oh. I know that guy. That's Con. And she pointed out Con. And the woman goes, Oh, that's my uncle Lon. Oh. Yeah, he lost his hand in a cotton gin when he was a teenager. You know, he died a long time ago. Not from that, which I know you were earmuffed, but that fits with the description Heidi was giving her mother when Con came to the door. Oh. Con is a nice guy. Con and Mr. Gordy are two separate people. And Heidi's able to identify them through photographs. But who's Harry? No, we don't know. So doctor, back to Dr. Roll, he start, he's trying to like measure all this stuff, right? He's a scientist. He wants to get the level of the magnetic exposure and fluctuation and all this stuff because he believes that if there's a high level of magnetic fluctuation, it can cause hallucinations. So he wants to check that out. And he puts all these little things, all these, this is very scientific of me, he puts all this equipment. Uh, throughout the house to try to get measurements to see if there's anything that might be causing them hallucinations. There are high fluctuations overnight when he leaves, leaves the sensor. So he starts to look at where the house is placed. And he believes that an earthquake, because it's near a fault line, had affected mm. the magnetic field and it was the cause of it. And all they were experiencing was hallucinations. And because they were so sensitive, it was more than like the average person might encounter. Okay. Which is fine. That's one way to explain it. But Andy, I love this guy. He's He's got that Georgia accent. He said that, you know, Dr. Roll's a really smart guy. And I, I can understand some of what he's saying. But there's some of the stuff that just doesn't cut it. Because the stuff that Ilana was earmuffed for earlier, how in the heck did that happen? And how do you explain that? That's not a hallucination. So they don't fully believe it. Now, as Heidi's getting older, right, once Jordan was born, she was a little older, the sightings of Mr. Gordy happen a lot less, Hmm. which is typical of people like this. And she kind of misses him a little bit. You know, he was really her best bud. But she still knows that he's around, but it's just not as vivid and it's not as frequent. And around this time, these stories start to come, like Unsolved Mysteries did an episode on it. Hmm. Right? There's a whole documentary on it. There's movies on it now. Wow. And local reporters started to come to the house. One local reporter showed up, stepped out, goes, nope, got back in and just took off. He's like, I don't. What do you mean? He did not like the vibe there. No, thank you. Just got back in his car and left. He said I mean, I would have done that just knowing the story. Something freaked him out. And he just left. So sadly, though, for Heidi, they're getting this media attention now, and she's getting bullied at school. Aww. Junior high was really, really hard for her. People are so cruel. They're sending notes to the house that are saying mean things about her and Mr. Gordy because everybody knows mm. the story. You know, they'll yell boo at her in the halls. They'll laugh at her. One time, these girls invited her to sit with them, and then they burned the ends of her hair. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, she's really... She is wishing that she just didn't have any of these experiences. This is very challenging for her. She's seeing what she's seeing. She can't help it. Lisa and Andy don't know what to do. How do you protect your child from something that you yourself can't see? Mm. It's a very tough situation that they're all in, and they can't afford to move. 
Now, Jordan, Heidi's little sister, she doesn't seem to see things in the same way that Heidi does, but she also one day is sitting there and just having a conversation in the hallway and her mom's like, hey, Jordan, who are you talking to? Just this girl, she died in a car accident. We don't worry about it. That's new. Just chit-chatting with this little girl in the hallway. So it's not just Heidi. It's the area. I mean, all of them are experiencing something. Every single one of one of them in the family has experienced something. Okay. So Dr. Roll starts to also look into the family background to see if they have a history of this because this kind of ESP, this extrasensory perception, some people are just more sensitive than others, tends to run in families. So he starts looking into the families and Lisa's family seems to have it in droves. Her her family has tons of stories where they've experienced things. Lisa's mother actually grew up in a place called Haunted Hollow, and it was on the Trail of Tears. Mm. And she would often report hearing people crying and screaming. Oh, God. And so it seems whatever this is, whatever you want to call this, it seems to be on Lisa's side of the family and just – the, each one of the members of that family have had an experience like this, and Heidi just seems to be the most sensitive. Dr. Roll also calls in a psychic. He's he's really trying to cover all the bases here. He's got these little gadgets all over. He's measuring everything. He's looking at I the guess, fault yeah. lines. He's trying to he's checking poisonous gases. I mean, he's going he's like checking everything. Is there any radon in here? What's going on? And he brings in a psychic. Now her name is Amy Allen, and she's actually a producer of The Dead Files. But he brings in somebody called Amy Allen. Now, he insists that she know nothing about it. He gives her no background. He's like, I just want you to go to this house and tell me what it's like for you. He won't let her meet the family. He won't tell her about the family. He won't let the family talk to her. So she arrives immediately, is sensing things, seeing things. She sees a little girl in the house, and she said that little girl was so solid she almost thought that somebody was in the house, which doesn't happen to her often, which is the little girl that Jordan saw. Heidi also had seen that little girl. She feels that there are male presences in the house. She said there is one that is a protector. That is a very nice, kind man, and he's a protector. There is another that's not so hot who's very, very angry. Harry Harry needs a serious timeout. So Amy, by the time that she's done, she agrees with some of the things Dr. Roll says. Like she thinks that the placement of the house is part of it. That it's the location and the things that have happened there. But she says it's honestly the family. Heidi has this gift. If they move, it might make it better, but it won't get rid of it. Hmm. Now, Lisa hears this a little bit validated because somebody else is saying exactly what yeah. you've been experiencing. But at the same time, she wants to she wants to take a more spiritual approach because they're very devoted to their Christian faith. And she wants to take a more spiritual approach. And so she brings in another psychic medium. Some psychic mediums hear things, some see things. He feels things. And he also describes everything that Heidi has described. And both he and Amy Allen say that the chimney, which is the thing that Heidi was staring at that first day, Mm -hmm. is almost like a door, like a portal. And it's super, super active. So again, this makes Lisa feel better, but also doesn't. Because how do you fix that? You leave. You can't just seal up an energetic spiritual world portal with some brick. How are you supposed to handle this? This is very upsetting to her. And she's also experiencing things. She's hearing voices at night, talking, saying her name. Nope, I'm out. I am so out of there. When that happens, she prays really loudly and really forcefully, and it gets rid of it. So she starts to do that more and more and more. She's going to develop a compulsive behavior. No, she does. I mean, that's that's all she has. They go to church, you know, every Sunday. They talk about it with their pastor. Their pastor comes to the house and does visits and he tries to, I mean, pray is is not strong enough a word for what they're doing. Almost like a spiritual ceremony that they're doing, trying to balance whatever is in this house. Because Lisa, Lisa really thinks that whatever's in this house is bad. Dr. Roll was like, no, nothing's bad. You're just hallucinating. And she's like, maybe, but it doesn't feel good. It's whatever's in here is a bad spirit and I want it out. How do you fight something you can't see that might be in a different realm? I guess that's the best option for you because the little doodads that Dr. Roll put out aren't cutting it. Nothing is happening. Get out of there. Leave. So, and this whole time Heidi's feeling, she feels like it's her fault. Mm. She feels guilty. 
She's feeling shame. Like, she can't help it. She's seeing what she's seeing. Like, she didn't even realize that they were ghosts when she was little. She, honest to God, thought they were just other humans. Wow, that's nuts. She didn't have the vocabulary or the understanding because they would ask her. Lisa would say, well, was it in your imagination or did it look like, you know, she's like, no, mommy, it looked like you. Hmm. What do you mean? What kind of question is that? It's a person. Yikes. So it takes them 15 years to save up enough money to be able to move because the family kept suffering these strange medical setbacks. Lisa had the two miscarriages. Heidi had to have several kind of random surgeries, like an appendix, her Mm -hmm. appendix burst. Andy also. Jordan had several issues that put her in the hospital with um, asthma. And so every time they would get a little bit ahead, they had to pay these medical bills. So it took them 15 years. They're finally like, Mm. we're out of here. Peace out. They they rent a townhouse. They move. Now they get, (laughs) you're going to freak. They get to this townhouse and Jordan is grown up a little bit. And so she needs a new bed frame because hers is small. You know, money's tight. So Lisa's like, well, we'll look through secondhand stores, you know, rummage sales. We'll try to find a bed frame in good condition for you. Yeah. And so they go to this estate sale and there's no bed frame. And the woman's like, are you looking for something else? She said, oh, I was looking for a bed frame for my daughter. She says, oh, I have a whole bedroom set that I'd like to get rid of. Come with me. She takes her in the house, takes her upstairs. No, it's haunted. Shows her the the bed frame and she's like, you can have it with the dressers and everything. And it's really beautiful, solid wood, antique. And she names this lowball price, which Lisa can't believe. Because she's trying to get rid of the spirit. They put it in the car and the woman's like, here you go. I'm so glad you're taking it. It hasn't been used in like 30 years. It belonged to a man named Mr. Gordy. (laughs) Are you kidding me? No, they had Mr. Gordy's bed. Why? (laughs) What? What? Lisa's like, ah, shit. She didn't tell Andy because he was already a little bit. Why would you take that home once you learn that? (laughs) It was already in the bed. It was already in the truck. And then they sold it when they got home like within a week. They sold it there. But even though Mr. Gordy was nice um, and a protector, real. they were like, no, no you don't like, want any what? of that shit. Bye. What the heck? So they sell it. They move to – a that was just a part-time place. They move to another rental place that's a lot bigger that they have to fix up for a break on the rent. But they move there. And Heidi at this point is much older. Yeah. She got married young, but she's engaged to be married at this time. She's, but she still is having these experiences and she just – she's like, I hate this house. Yeah. I hate it. And you're going to want to earmuff. Oh, my God. She goes to bed one night. She's starting to feel that presence like she, you know, had at the old house. And then she feels somebody pick her up from her feet. And she's screaming and screaming and screaming. And by the time Lisa gets in there, she's shaking. And Lisa spends the night with her that night and the next night. And as they're both laying in bed, the blankets are lifted up like a tent, like from the corner, lifted up and then dropped. Somebody picked something up and then dropped it. It becomes very clear at this point that this is their life. That move, these move to Oregon. You don't think there are ghosts in Oregon? Well, get out of the state. I don't know. I don't think they're ghosts. Get out of there. Ugh. So Heidi just has to face the fact that this is her life. And you know, she says that she doesn't consider it a curse, but she doesn't consider it a gift and she wished that it just she just didn't have it whatever it is she's married now and you know hopefully happily married and living her life she is not somebody who's trying to get because there are there are other uh, hauntings like this that I'm like really okay I don't know and there's reasons why you can see how they would have been making it up but I, this this family is just they're so solid and they're so truthful and it's so many people within the family have experienced it. I didn't even get into all of the things. Here's one. One time Heidi was getting ready to play piano and her grandfather, who didn't believe any of this, was like, yeah, let's play it. And then he saw her ponytail go straight up and Heidi started screaming and she's like, let go of me. Terry. But he could see it pulling at her roots. Jeez. So many people have seen this and experienced it. Heidi has these psychic abilities that allow her to see stuff that most people can't see. And it sounds like it's a heavy load to carry. So I don't know. But, man, she's accurate. I mean, she knew it was Mr. Gordy. Mr. Gordy lived next door. She described him. She picked him out of a lineup. I don't get it. She did the same with Lon. I don't get it. Can you imagine having to deal with that all the time? Like, you're just trying to – 
I mean, life is hard enough. You're trying to go to the grocery store. You got like a screaming kid and you're trying to find stuff for dinner or whatever. And then suddenly like a ghost just interrupts, knocks all those soup cans into your car. And you're like, ah, dude, no. I'm trying to get out of here. <laughs> no, no, thank you. Life is hard enough. You don't need to be having these entities that other people can't see bugging you. What happened to Harry? He stayed at the house. Bye. Do we know why he's angry? We do not know. She never saw his face. She said she always just felt like he was very angry and menacing presence. He stayed at the house. I don't think she saw him again. And she could never see any part of him. It was always just an outline. Hmm. Bye. You can stay there. I just imagine Prince Harry, so it's not scary. Great. <laughs> Mr. Gordy was definitely a protector. Sounds like it. I would not be happy with my life if I was her. Yeah, I don't know that you could hang. Mm -mm. I don't think I could. Oof. I don't think so. I don't think I could. I think I would, I don't know. I'd run away and never come back. Maybe it'd be different if it happened when you were little. Maybe. Yeah, I probably would not be like how I am today. Where do you think your fear came from? I don't know. We were talking about this. I don't know. I should ask my parents where it all started. But I've always been, I think I've always been like this. But I, f I feel like it has to come some from somewhere because I used to, like with spiders, I'm not that scared of them anymore, but I used to be really scared of them. But I also remember being not scared of them at all. And then my godmother got bit by a brow recluse. And then after that point, I think I was scared. Well, that makes so sense. So I wonder if something did happen with that. Do you think you saw a ghost and then you got No, scared? ghosts aren't real. <sighs> Keep telling yourself that. I will. Ghosts aren't real. All this stuff, not real. I don't know. Maybe you just like I saw something in a movie too early. Yeah, I was wondering. Maybe you just saw something because could be horror movie. I don't I like mean, horror movies either. They're too much. I hate. I hate them so much. Yeah, like why? I don't like them. Why do you? Why do you want to watch something and be scared? I think I just like my imagination. Like I even scary movie three. <laughs> that's how bad it is because the ring girl was in it. I couldn't sleep for two weeks. That's how bad I am. It's not a, it's like people don't think I'm serious until they get to experience it live. Like when I was in Vermont, we did like a, a moonlight walk in the woods. And I, I'm like, I'm, I couldn't look anywhere but at the ground because I was that scared. Like it's a real thing. God, are you going to be okay tonight? Yeah, because it's Prince Harry and it's, it's okay. Like and most of, most of them were friendly. So I think that's okay. Yeah, and also you yeah. did a good job earmuffing me. I earmuffed you for like 25 minutes. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm here some my tea, just watching your facial expressions and your hand movements. <laughs> yeah, don't, you're not going to be listening to this one back. I'll tell you that. You better believe it. <laughs> I'll make sure, I'll, I'll do the listen. <laughs> oh man! Well, you're a trooper. Yeah, that was that's a real ghost story for you. It is fascinating to me. I just think it's so fascinating. I think that people there are there have to be people who can see other things. Like mm -mm. some people can't in my in my head. In my head. In my head. That's how that works. <laughs> I hope the Wyrick wow. family is doing great, and I hope they're me living too. in a brand new build on a brand new piece of land. Did you check on her? She doesn't. She kind of stays out of the spotlight. So makes sense yeah Trevor she's kind of like i'm over it thanks <laughs> yeah. uh, but i hope she's doing great and i hope the whole rest of the family is and gosh what a journey i mean even if it wasn't real that's terrifying i mean the bottom line is it was real to them whether you believe right. it or not and can you imagine how scary that i can you yeah. Just imagine me in that situation game over i'm done after the first instance and there were so many more yeah, yeah. I was scared last night after I finished the book. I was like, taking a shower curtain. <laughs> I'm like, just want, just want to do a quick check. Just do a quick check. Make sure we're good. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I believe it, but I know you don't. So, you know, we're Ugh. team divided. <laughs> All right. Well, do you wow. have any last words? You know, a few episodes ago, I said, give ghosts a chance. But <laughs> I'm reconsidering <laughs> We'd like to retract know, our previous statement. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't. It doesn't seem worth it. Doesn't seem worth it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, poor Heidi. They're nice. <sighs> I don't know. It's yeah, just, just steer like clear. Steer just clear. steer clear of Alana. We, there's just no yeah. need. 
This, this is a no need. ghost zone. Yeah. <laughs> Go elsewhere. Go Thank elsewhere. Thank you very much. All right. Anything else? Hey, thank you for earmuffing me. Yeah, you're welcome. I mean, half of me wants to know because I just always want to know, but half of me knows it's for the best. Yeah, it's for the best. And I'll sleep better tonight. All right. Well, you can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram at Tea Time Crimes, unless you're a ghost. (laughs) You can email us at Tea Time Crimes at gmail.com. No ghost stories, please. And we should be back to our normal format next time. Yeah, no more scaries. Who should listen, Alana? Not ghosts. Get out of here. Actually, <laughs> you know what? Take a listen and see what you do to people. Take a listen and understand it and have some empathy. Um, let's see who else. Grandfathers, family members, nieces, nephews, reporters, and I guess Oxford students and graduates. Okie dokie. Cool. All right. Well, thank you for listening if you did. And we'll talk to you (laughs) next time. Bye. Bye. Spooky. Mm -hmm.